Welcome to PostBurnout.com interviews. My name is Aaron Kavanagh and I'm the website's founder and editor-in-chief. PostBurnout.com is a culture website dedicated to venerating burnt-out artists the world over. Our interviews are mainly recorded to be transcribed, but every now and again we release the audio in a series we call PostBurnout.com interviews. If you enjoy what we do, be sure to subscribe. In this edition of PostBurnout.com interviews, we speak with the legendary alternative musician Juliana Hatfield. She talks about her upcoming album Juliana Hatfield Sings ELO, why she chose to make a cover album of Electric Light Orchestra songs, working with the likes of Evan Dando, Paul Westerberg and Matthew Cause, her new substack, featuring on the Salt Collective's new album Life, her career, where she is in life, mental health, privacy and more. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, I th- the first thing I wanted to ask was, um, I, I was kind of thinking back to your um, autobiography, When I Grow Up, and that's uh, on its 15 year anniversary, I think this year. And um, in that um, in that book, you you kind of talk about um, the rise of of yourself from uh, starting the Blake Babies project to going to a solo artist to the kind of explosion at MTV and, and alternative radio. And you kind of contrast that with a, a then recent tour you did with your project Sun Girls um, after kind of um, after I guess the kind of MTV craze uh, died down and I think that's like a, a situation a lot of artists have found themselves in who were kind of part of that kind of alternative explosion in the 90s and yeah. now 15 years later I mean how do you think things have changed since you've written that autobiography? You mean well for me or for the culture at large? I guess just speaking as an individual artist, how do you feel that um, your career has changed since you, you wrote that book? Since I wrote the book? Well, I've kind of been just continuing to power on um, making my music without paying too much mind to um, the the market. You know, like I, I, I always, always had a big, uh, I had a lot of difficulties trying to um, blend art and commerce. And mm-hmm. I think that when I was, you know, when I was signed to Atlantic Records after the Blake Babies broke up and then they had this, you know, they were pushing me and I had the, I had the, you know, MTV exposure and things like that. I, I had a hard time um, dealing with it. Unfortunately, you know, I was not, really prepared for for all that fame or whatever small amount of fame I had and for just the the attention and the kinds of things that were the kind of attention I was getting it was making me uncomfortable so I think that when everything died down I thought of myself as just um just making you know readjusting to um getting back to where I started with the Blake babies which was doing everything quietly under the radar doing a lot of it myself being you know doing it cheaply Mm -hmm. inexpensively and I I feel like I just kind of since the book I've been on that same trajectory which is maybe not up so fast but anymore and or down so fast anymore but I'm just on a kind of steady trajectory making my music for a smaller audience and I maybe that's not a very interesting answer but that's just the way the way it is and I'm and as time goes by, I get more and more comfortable as an artist. And it is unfortunate that I was so, I had, I had no confidence back then when I was getting all the attention. The most, when I was getting the most attention, I had the least confidence. I was so insecure. And I, I think I'm just a better, I'm, I'm more happy about my abilities now and I, I'm more in charge of them. Yeah, and I think um, since then, there. I, I feel like with your discography, there is a real kind of radical sense of freedom. I, uh, after, um, I think it was God's Foot that was recorded and wasn't released by Atlantic and that kind of sat on the shelf. I think from there you start self-releasing music and then uh, create your own uh, label yield records. For a number of years, you were um, uh, doing pledge music, which I don't think exists anymore, but it was like uh, crowdfunding right. for your for your albums. And then I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was the last Julian Hatfield Tree album, Whatever My Love, um, that was a now the last project you crowdfunded but simultaneously was the the first record um on uh, american laundromat records uh first of your projects i mean um so yeah i think like um do you think that um do you think there's like that sense of freedom now that you have that maybe you didn't have uh when you were like a big superstar 
definitely there's definitely uh i feel so much freedom and you know there's no no scrutiny on me like there was back then no no one is well you know with social media there's always people there are always going to be people who are um judging anyone who's out there but um it's yeah it's just a much lower level of that and i'm not there's not the pressure to succeed commercially um there's not the whole machinery that wants you to be marketable i can do it and and yeah the freedom a, a sign of my freedom is that i can make these albums like an album of elo songs which yeah. is like very self indulgent i think but <laughs> But or, you know, you could say it's self-indulgent or you could say it's just fun because, um, I mean, it was challenging, but it was it's like I can do that. I can wake up and say I want to make an album of, I don't know, like a, a cover album of all blur songs or something like yeah. I could conceivably start working on that whenever I want. And I have this great partnership with um American Laundromat, the record company, it's just like, a, it's such a great setup because I can do whatever I want. And he's, you know, like Joe, the guy who runs the label, Joe Spadaro, is so just welcoming of whatever I do. And he, he can get them out like one album out a year, pretty much. And yeah. um, it's a really good, and he's really fair. And it's very, he has a very equitable pay set up and um royalty set up and um it's just a really great period for me right now i feel like i can do oh, so much creatively without too much scrutiny that too without too much negative scrutiny sure yeah it can be debilitating emotionally it really can yeah and i think like since you, you can really see that just in terms of your output i mean i think of the last second i mean um like it's been a new record like every year every second year um and yeah i mean like um to kind of go back i was just i've just briefly touched on it but when i, I was rereading your chapter when you were talking about recording god's foot in, in your book and you know a big contention there was that they couldn't hear a single and nowadays that seems like such a, a kind of antiquated um uh kind of issue you know what i mean like it's it, yeah. it seems like kind of with streaming and internet culture the idea of having to have a big hit on like the radio or on you know a big music video on mtv or something like that it, it just seems like um i don't know kind of superfluous yeah it's to it's totally different now um yeah you don't i mean back then it was like you needed a big hit single in order to push the album release like there was always an album release and something had to you know, pull the album into people's faces. And, and, you know, now you can just put out a song, put it out into the world, and it can gr bloom on its own, you know, it can find its own audience. But it that that the way things are now has its own set of, um, you know, pro uh, problems. It's just because now anyone who wants to, to make a splash um has to be willing to try to get attention you know you have yeah. to push yourself out there because there's no record company pushing you yeah uh, you know there used to be this machine machinery the whole rec all the departments of the record company and the radio department marketing departments and they would help get your name and your song out there but now you kind of have to do it yourself and if and that's that's always been the difficult part for me has been the self-promotion yeah so i don't know i don't know if i would have been able to make a splash if i were starting out today in the in the world of the internet um the world of the internet i don't know and streaming and stuff yeah i, I feel that like a lot of musicians nowadays like when you're signing up to be a musician it's not just uh, a matter of i'm going to be a songwriter and i'm going to record my music and tour it's like you're also wearing many different hats you know you have to do uh, pr and you have to do social media managing and you have to uh, i think a lot of people have to produce now i think like especially during um COVID 19 there was a lot of people who um took that hat on too like where they couldn't go to like a recording studio so they had to make stuff at home and um, yeah, yeah so do you think that like um now that it's like being a musician is perhaps uh i don't know has changed since like maybe you started with like babies or yeah i mean yeah i i do i mean one does have more control over one's whatever you want to call it one's career or one's whole um whatever you know art 
art system of art delivery. But yes, then that means that the artist has to take on a whole range of things that the artist maybe didn't used to have to or wasn't prepared to or doesn't enjoy. Like, you know, all, when I started my label, there were all kinds of things I had to do. Like I had to become an accountant, a business mm -hmm. person. I had to start hiring people to, you know, do graphic design, to do radio. If I wanted to promote a song to radio, you know, you have to start hiring people or and also there's um oh was it gonna say oh yeah the whole thing about engineering i never had anything to do with engineering when i was recording earlier in my career and i, I hated i always hated math in school i hated mm -hmm. science um i was so confused by the by the um control boards and studios it just seemed like a big jumble of gibberish to me mm -hmm. um but yeah with the with the lockdown I wanted to keep being productive, so I had to learn how to record onto my laptop. And I, 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 with a friend's help, with a lot of help, I was able to figure out how to use GarageBand, which was already built into my laptop. And I, and I know it was kind of obsolete at that point, but I was able to make a whole album while I was learning to use GarageBand. And and for, I hated it. I was like, it was like pulling teeth, getting me to try to figure out. How to record at home but ultimately it was really good for me and now i'm really glad i have those tools you feel um the kind of post-production side now now that you're kind of um adapt at using um at, at using garage band uh, to be maybe an extension of your creative uh, expression in the sense that you know it can kind of be a bit of a pain to learn a musical instrument like guitar or piano for the first time but once you do then you have all this creative expression that you can you know uh, that you can utilize and simultaneously i mean like you were talking about the kind of engineering side being very mechanical and very uh, mathematical but simultaneously once you kind of um uh, once you kind of grasp it i mean it is just another extension and it kind of gives i think like i was saying like in the way that um being uh self-releasing albums or, or doing music independently uh has given you kind of a lot more uh free range simultaneously having the production side to yourself may may do too I do I do feel like I have um yeah more range within which to work totally independently you know mm -hmm. I used to always record in the recording studio and when I'm uh, you know I'm at the mercy of engineers and things having to plug in everything chords and things and um I'm gonna get levels and things but um at the same time, I, I I still do hate engineering. I don't really enjoy all that stuff, but it, I have to balance that with, I have to acknowledge like that, yes, I do have more freedom to work independently now, and that is a good thing. It's a balance, and, and I get really frustrated a lot with just technical glitches, and I have to go and get in touch with my friend who's my sort of... Uh, my helper with the technology and he he can usually he's like my living um what's that word oh, tech support yeah well whatever yeah. he's like he's like a living breathing tech support um that i have access to I, uh, sorry i lost my train of thought no but the... yeah oh, and plus i'm using like i when i say i mastered garage band i mean like i'm using maybe like 0.001% of, of its capabilities. I'm using like the bare, bare minimum of what it can do. And it's like an, it's an old garage band also. <laughs> so I'm not really utilizing it as a creative tool. I don't think it's more just like a way for me to try to, uh, you know, put sounds down in my home. Yeah. And actually going back to kind of maybe what I touched on a little bit about like um, during uh, uh, COVID, a lot of people um, had to kind of go through different avenues. And one thing um, I know, so you were doing was soon the um, kind of illustrations that was sort of um, you were selling um, uh, illustrative work that you've, you've done. Um, and yeah, I was wondering, do you think like those aspects too can can be beneficial? Because like when I look at the the album art from some of your work recently, particularly Blood and Pussycat, I mean, again, kind of going back to the, to the freedom that I mean, you seem to enjoy. It's like you know, it, it seems like very unconventional album art if if it was to be like dictated by a label. Oh yeah, I think so. Um, 
that's that's another thing I like about American Laundromat. Um, Joe Spadaro, he he he's this really really sweet guy, like very mellow, um, very sweet, and he just like is cool with whatever I do. <laughs> it's the greatest thing. I've never. I mean, I had I invited. He doesn't ever co- say he wants to come to the studio and listen to works in progress. He's totally hands off. But I, when I was working on Pussycat, I, I invited him to come to the studio just to sort of hear what I was doing because I was I was worried that um, he might be put off by some of the edgier songs, you know, sure. stuff I was thinking about what was going on in the United States politically at the time. And I didn't, at that point, we were kind of new in our working relationship and I didn't really know what his politics were. Um, and he was, but I, but he came by and he listened. He was totally cool with it and he's totally on the side of, you know, good. He's on the good. Mm-hmm. He's not on the evil evil side. And um, yeah, he's just totally cool. He's up He's up for whatever I'm, it will, I'm interested in doing. Um. Speaking of uh, your new uh, album, which is uh, Julianne and Hatfield Sings ELO, this is the third um, in a series following The Police and Olivia Newton-John. Um, I was wondering how you kind of um, decide which artists you're going to cover for an album. Well, it's very intuitive for me. I, uh, I never really conceptualize much of what I do beforehand, um, except the idea was, oh, a covers, an album of one artist, all covers. And then, um, yeah, it was just an idea that popped into my head. And I, I had the first one, I had Olivia Newton-John on my mind because her I knew that her cancer had come back at that point. And I was just thinking, oh no, and I, I want to see her play while I can. And my friend and I, um, went to see her in um, kind of obscure town in Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania, which was not near to either of us, but that was the closest place she was playing a concert. And we went, we went to see her, and it was one of the last shows she did. And hmm. and so I don't know, I'm getting off off track right now, but that so that was for how the first album happened. I was just thinking, I was thinking a lot of Olivia and John because I always loved her, and I knew that she was having health issues and maybe you know I need it was the last time I was going to get to see her and so she was on my mind and then with ELO um I actually was thinking a lot about doing after I done um Olivia and the police I was thinking I should do an American band just because of covered an Australian and and an English band I should I should do an American just to kind of spread (laughs) spread the love around the globe and and I was going to do REM mm-hmm. and I was listening. I was the process for me starts with going deep into the albums and the deep, all the deep cuts and re listening and finding things I want to record. And I just became too overwhelmed with the um, amount of REM material that I had never heard because I, I stopped listening to them at some point. Mm-hmm. And there were a bunch of albums after that, and, and I just felt like there was too much study I was gonna have to do, and there was um, there were too many too many songs, and I I lost my will, my I lost my nerve for that yeah, one. Yeah, sure, sure. And then I, I just I don't know. I guess I thought oh, I love VLO, so let's do that. Yeah. So uh, the first uh, single release off it uh, was Don't, uh, Don't Bring Me Down. And um, yeah, so I was wondering, like, again, why did you uh, choose that song? And just in general, do you think it's a good indicator of how um, how your kind of uh, covers of, of these songs are going to uh, sound on the record? Well, um, first of all, I like the song. I love the song. It's such a it's a it's a very solid construction Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's just like kind of perfect um and i stupidly thought oh this will be easy to record it's so it's so simple yeah and then so then i started recording it and i realized oh it's deceptively simple it's actually really complicated um when you think about like 
the there's so many when you listen to ELO songs they especially especially a lot of the hits they just kind of like glide along and they seem they're so catchy and they're so delectable and and it's like ear candy and you and you don't think there's any difficulty even when there's some like crazy string stuff crazy in the sense that it's like innovative for strings you know and it's in rock music and it's not expected it still make it all just makes so much sense in the context of the songs yeah but when you break it down it's like, like with with um I, I actually did a first version of Don't Bring Me Down, which was a total failure, and I had to start over. But the first version, I played, I tried to play drums on it because I thought, oh, it's just one beat that they looped. How easy is that? Mm -hmm. I can play that loop myself. But there's so much more going on. It's not just a loop, and and um, it was it was a disaster the first version. So then I just had to rework it and try not to try to match their sounds and try to just find my own groove um it's it's kind of hard to talk about the process process of recording because it's like an, it's going into an a, another world of shadows you know and it's hard it's like going into a brain it's hard to describe which Maybe. is like a process process of trying you tr you start playing the song you start trying to find your own groove rather than copying the groove of the band it's like you've got to you have to play it over and over until you feel the groove in your own bones and then you just go from there do you think that um kind of delving into um bands discographies and not only doing that but like um um covering the songs yourself do you think that influences you then as a songwriter lyrically or, or musically or do you are you kind of um or are you kind of good at like um, separating the two and saying, no, I'm drawing a line to sand between this is this music and here's my stuff or. I think that whenever I'm recording covers, I'm hoping that it will influence my own writing because when I write my own songs, I, I, I always follow into fall into patterns, um, just the same kinds of chord progressions and chord movements, same kinds of melodies and and I, sometimes I feel like a broken record and I want to be pulled out of my habits. And But then I, I, I always find that after I've done the covers album, I keep, I keep reverting back to my own habits. It's the weirdest yeah. thing. Like, I wish I were more influenced by other, the other people's songs. Um, but I think I just, like, have this songwriting gene in me and i can't really alter it that much although i keep trying well you've been involved in several different projects including you know your own obviously your own solo stuff but um you every now and again the blake baby says do a reunion uh, you're also involved with the i don't cares with paul westerberg and minor alps with matthew cause and um you obviously do work with the lemon heads and um the juliana hatfield tree which is kind of in, in some ways, like it's its own separate thing too. I was wondering, like, how, how you feel like the um your music and you as a musician differs when involved in different projects, and how do you kind of decide who who to work with? Um, I think, yeah, who are if I'm playing with um different players who have strong musical personalities, like like Frida Love as a drummer has a unique drumming style and sound and so and with John Strom the other Blake baby he's got a distinctive guitar sound and tone and and all of our personalities are very distinct so when the three of us get together it's a it's a unique combination and mm -hmm. you can't get anyone else to play like Frida no one else can no one else has that vibe and so I think, yeah, definitely the other players bring um, a quality to those projects. And I mean, obviously with Paul Westerberg, that's Paul Westerberg. So yeah, <laughs> you can't replicate him. That I mean, that project, I don't care as I feel like that was more about him and, and I was there to support him. And I was just adding a little bit to what he had already established in those songs. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Yeah, it's different. It's like, and with Matthew, cause that was like really a joining of um, two voices that um, blended so well. I I always was a huge fan of Matthew's voice. He's one of my probably top five singers of all time. And and I um, when we were talking about working together, I for me it was just like, oh, I love his voice. It's gonna be so fun to sing with him but I didn't I did not foresee how wonderfully we would blend and and both of us Matthew and I both were amazed at how sometimes when we're singing together on recording we can't tell some there are moments where we can't tell whose voice is whose yeah and that's just like a cool magical potion that just happens sometimes when you are working with someone well I think of um your work, your collaborative work with Evan Dandel. In fact, the first um, time I saw you guys was, um, I don't know if you remember the show, but you, uh, you guys played the Sugar Globe in Dublin. Uh, back I do in 2012. remember that. Yeah. Remember. That was the first time I saw you guys. And it was just like, I, it was really kind of like, that That pairing seems like kind of lightning in the bottle in the sense that it, it really does seem like, um, as songwriters, you guys are very sympathetical. I mean, it, it seems like in terms of the type of music you're writing, but I think also um, the kind of lyrics in a way where I, I feel like both of you guys are kind of um, willing to to sort of write in a way that other, that not other, but like a lot of songwriters are kind of perhaps afraid to touch upon, if that makes sense. You mean in what in what sense? That's just like more, I feel like, um, I, I feel like they... they yeah, I feel like they find it, um, I don't know, they find it perhaps like, I don't know, too simplistic or something like that. I don't yeah. know how to explain it, but I feel like you guys can really distill things down to um, a kind of, I don't know, not this might sound insulting, but I mean, this in a very positive way, in a very childlike way, where it's like, you know, it's that kind of, it's, it's, it's that kind of, um, I don't know, it's subverting kind of the over-intellectualization of, of, uh, how you feel about things and just saying things very straight. Oh, thank you. I yeah, I think that's nice to hear because I I don't like to intellectualize music or and I don't like when critics do that either. Like they're always trying to find some kind of theme or a purpose. Whereas for me there's no purpose other than just trying to stay alive you know it's like mm -hmm. making music it's like just a thing that I have to do and I and obviously I'm not trying to write for the masses or for commercial success I'm, there's no reason for me other than just trying to do something that I think is um good work mm -hmm. or, or just I'm really just trying to explore my own psyche, I guess. And I think Evan does the same. Mm -hmm. And I, and um yeah, I think Evan's a, a great, great songwriter and I'm sad that he's not writing more songs these days. And um 'cause it because I miss his songwriting. I miss his songs and he's I mean there are, there's his, you know, catalog to listen to, which is it do, and it doesn't get old. It's always sounds very fresh. But he, yeah, he's he's definitely a unique writer and singer and and voice. And um, he he he's such a great lyricist too. It's yeah. like um, I feel in in awe of his lyrics actually. Yeah, yeah. No, and I agree. And I think that's the other thing is that um. They have like a real, I think, emotional impact. And and again, like even some a song like "Rocking Stroll," for example, like I, it's 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 such a unique perspective. It's just like it's something that I just don't think a lot of people would think to write about. And I think that's also another thing that you guys do very well is is really take things from a very uh, unique perspective. And um, for your example, I think of like um, "Choose Drugs," you know, and it's just it, it, I don't know. It's just it's a way of expressing these kind of ideas and emotions that are that are very unique i think i think because we're both oddballs i mean yeah <laughs> we're i think you, it, you have to have an you have to be an oddball have an odd, oddball perspective to, to have confidence in your 
odd ideas. I mean, to us, they don't feel like odd ideas. They just feel like it's just it's just me, you know. I'm just mm-hmm. trying to be true to who I am, and maybe it's the weirdos that um, speak to that really speak to the truth in people. Because a lot of people in public or in society are afraid to be honest. I mean, understandably, mm-hmm. it's not. It's not hard to be honest. All the, I mean, it's not easy to be honest all the time. But um, yeah. I, I also when you were talking about rocking, rock and stroll, I I wanted to mention this song "Stove." Do you know the Lemonhead song "Stove"? Uh, I'm not aware of it off the top of my head. It wasn't on an album. It was on mm-hmm. um, it was on an EP, an, an old EP, or maybe it was a B-side. It's called "Stove," and I love that song. It's it's um, it's talking about replacing an old having an old broken down stove re- taken out of the house and brought and having a new stove put in and how it's so melancholic seeing the old stove leave the house and and I I just it's such a bittersweet sad beautiful song and it's about yeah. a stove and the worker you know the workers who bring the stove in in on their truck and um it's just like that just that scene um that domestic scene and how it can stir up feelings and how I and I tend to anthropomorphize like that too like I I give human qualities and emotions to objects and so I really love that song you should check it out Stove. Oh. yeah I absolutely will I, I do love that kind of yeah poignancy to stuff that people may find mundane or trivial it's it's really I don't know I, I think there's like a, a beautiful kind of elegy to a lot of things in life that a lot of people kind of overlook yeah, yeah. Every, I mean, I guess the older you get too, it's like you were, you want to hold on to every moment and you can see the magic in every little scene that because everything is so momentary, you know, not, you know, there's not, nothing is everlasting. Yeah. Um, one thing, just talking about the collaborations, you were also recently involved with the Salt Collective. Um, I was wondering if maybe you could just talk a little bit about that. Well, that was just the thing that they, it, they, it came to me, they, out of the blue, these people were reaching out to me, like, um, well, Chris, well, I was talking to my, my friend, Scott Litt, a record producer who produced the Julian Hackfield 3 debut album, Become What You Are, and he is a good friend, good friend of mine, and we're still in touch, and he was, he just, I think he mentioned that his friend, his good friend, Chris Stamey, had mentioned doing this project, and um, so Scott, Scott Lid kind of told me about it first. He's like, can Chris, um, get in touch? Chris wants to get in touch with you for this project. And I said, oh, cool. Chris Damey. Great. Cool. Yeah. Tell, tell him to get in touch with me. So Chris, I think it was Chris re- reached out to me and told me about the project. And he said, Matthew was in, Matthew Cause was involved and Richard Lloyd and this other guy, you know, French, French people. Mm-hmm. I didn't know and but with all those people involved I thought like oh it's gonna be great um I'm very interested so let me hear let me hear something and then I think yeah it was just that kind of casual process he um they sent me a version of the song they or songs they wanted me to sing on and I liked them and so I recorded some vocals at Chris's um, um, uh, direction mm-hmm. production through at my friend's basement studio. We recorded them, and yeah, so I didn't really, I didn't really, I still don't really have a full grasp on everyone who's involved, but I'm really yeah. happy with how the stuff turned out with me and with Matthew. Yeah. And um what yeah, but I was thinking like um, you know, you mentioned before that like you don't really um pay attention to um I guess like a lot of music, like modern music. You, you uh, I heard that in an interview before, but that was from a couple of years back. I was wondering, has anything changed now? Do you um still kind of listen to the same uh, music nowadays or, or are you um exploring new music or it's so bad and I don't listen to anything it's terrible that I I just like I can't it's weird I can't really focus on 
listening to anything. Um, and I have this problem when where I listen to music on whenever I listen to anything on headphones, even mm -hmm. at a low volume, it makes my ears ring afterwards. I get my tinnitus, tinnitus flares up a little bit after sure. listening to anything. And um yeah, it's weird. I don't I don't really know what to say or how to explain that I never listen to music, but I've never listened to music. Except <laughs> you know, I was listening to tons of ELO. Yeah. And I'm and I'm still kind of listening to ELO a little bit. Um but because I'm always discovering new things in those recordings that I never noticed before. So yeah. I'm I'm woefully unaware of what's going on in the world musically Current, <laughs> okay. current currently someone and, gave me a record of a new of a new release of a band that's well regarded and they didn't, i just you know, i couldn't get into it and that was my last attempt <laughs> to listen to do, do you have a personal preference for uh, how you listen to music because you were kind of mentioning that um listening to headphones kind of flares are pretty nice i like i do like headphones just because i I'm, I have this, I have a hard time um, focusing on uh, multiple, oh, I don't know how to describe this. Like when I'm in the studio listening to mixes, I, I put on headphones and then I put my hands over my eyes because sight distracts me from hearing. Sure. Um, so I do like to have headphones on because it's there are no distractions coming through the air sure it's very immersive yeah yeah um but i like i said i have to be it, i have to be careful because that inflames my tinnitus which is very mild and mm -hmm. it comes and goes so um and i don't have a good system right now i have a record player but there's no headphone jack so that's kind of a problem <laughs> and I have a little like Sony Walkman, which is what I listen to stuff on. So it's not yeah. the best situation right now for um, listening. Speaking of your your projects, I mean, um, you recently started at Subsec. Um, I was wondering what made you kind of want to get into that kind of direct writing, um, where it's not like where your writing, I guess, isn't um, is mediated by music, let's say, to the audience and being very direct with them. Um, yeah, I was wondering what was the kind of catalyst for that. Well, I spend a lot of time writing prose, and I never let any, I pretty much never let anyone see it, or no one ever sees any of it. Mm -hmm. And I just keep plugging away and writing and writing, and I'm, I'm hoping that at some point I can put something together, put a book together that I can publish. But I don't have a lot of, it's hard for me to really finish anything. I don't have a, a lot of confidence and I I just felt like I should share some of it instead of just flailing around in in so in isolation. Mm -hmm. Just because I just started to think that I have all this writing. Some of it I think is not bad. Um I should share it. Just just for the sake of sharing it. Um like like I share music, sharing, quote unquote, share music. People buy it. I understand that. <laughs> but I mean, putting music out there is is sharing, even though it's for sale. Yeah. Yeah. And I think also the like subset, the writing, the prose writing is free, though. Yeah. Yeah, it's a free subsec. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that's the other thing. It's also you like I, I touched on it earlier, but you you um for years you shared your your illustrations on on Twitter. Now you do them on Instagram, and um, yeah, I was wondering like, do you think like, because I, I I mean my perception of you and maybe this is incorrect, but you seem like a very um private person beyond um kind of uh what you, like in, in which is odd because I think your music is very personal, very um like exposes a lot of, of, of your thoughts and your feelings. But I think like you make a good distinction between going like, you know, not recording every single moment of your life, but like when it comes to the art perspective now, do you feel like it's kind of, um, I don't know, an idea seminar? Um, an idea seminar. Yeah. It feels like kind of like the, it's expression because if you're, you know, exposing your, your, 
pros and you're exposing your um, art like that, it feels like, I don't know, it feels like it's open for, in a lot of ways, direct critique. Wait, it, what, can you say with that again? It, what? Sorry. If, yeah, it feels like if it, like by um, kind of. I'm soliciting um, direct critique, you say? Yeah, no, by, by putting your, your pros up directly and putting your, your illustrations up directly, it's open to um, kind of direct critique. Not, and I would say yeah. that critique in a bad way, but it's like, it, it is this kind of idea of like, um, I don't know, like getting immediate um, feedback, let's say. I guess, I guess so. With the, with the artwork, I think it's more like, I want to show people what I've done. Like, look what I did. Check yeah. this out. But with, um, yeah, it's because it's, because I like it you know I'm I really I'm so amused like by some of my drawings and I make I make myself laugh and I'm like I gotta show people this. <laughs> or you know I, I also think that some of it's just um it expresses parts of me that I can't express any other way I mean it's kind of twisted and dark but also funny and um a very very um unpolished I like to say mm -hmm. Some of my drawings are very unpolished and I think I'm just trying to show like like I am a very private shy person in real life and so I think that having this way to share parts of parts of how I um can express myself it's it's just a way sharing the artwork and the writing is a way for me to um communicate really it's a way for me to communicate safely because I feel so unsafe in social situations or uncomfortable in social um situations it, it's just like that for me is like a labyrinth I have a hard time navigating but if I can share parts of me with parts of my outlook through my artwork and my writing it's just it's really just a way to communicate and when people um comment if I'm in a mood where I can handle reading comments, um, it's it's good to hear what people are thinking. Yeah, some people are thinking. And <laughs> um, one final thing I'd like to because you can't. It is when I, I make music and I put it out into the world because I have a need to um, share those parts of myself or to me com communicate something somehow indirectly. Yeah, and I know that giving music to people and having them hear it and react privately that that is a way of communication even though it's not direct and I'm not I'm not seeing or hearing their reaction to my music but I know that it's happening and that's it's enough for me to know that there is that um it's like a give and take and um I I don't need it to be direct person to person to be satisfied do you think that um, sort of drive you're talking about there is, is uh, the reason for your longevity in, in your career? I mean, you've been going over for uh, over 30 years now at this point, right? Yeah, I guess it's just like my will to keep going and to keep um, producing stuff and to keep my will to keep putting it out into the world. It just keeps me, keeps me going. Yeah. Yeah. And music, yeah. it just needs to be heard, I think. I mean, there's, um, I think like someone like Paul Westerberg has a different attitude maybe because he he made all this music in his basement and he just kept it in his basement but when I was working with him for the I don't care that it was like we were gonna take some of that music and put it out into the world and um, but I think that he has a whole ton of stuff that no one will ever hear probably which is fine I have a lot of stuff that no one will ever hear, but I put the majority of, majority of what I write out into the world. Do you think um, the decision to release certain things or not is is based on um, maybe sometimes um, what you've expressed being too personal, or do you think it's just more um, a dissatisfaction with the end result, or, or how do you make those determinations? Um, it's probably a little of both of those things, or it's like... Um, I just at some point I just make a determination like this is good enough. I like to say in the studio, oh, this is good enough. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, it's like because I because I am kind of I have a kind of sloppy aesthetic, and mm -hmm. I like a sort of I don't like things that are too polished and whittled down. But yeah. But yeah, it's, I just like I make an intuitive determination at some point. Like 
I think people, I think it's done. I think it's done. And when it's done, people can see it or hear it. But I have had regrets. I think that there are some songs from my past that are like maybe too, a little too close to the edge of being too personal. And even something, some of the things from my last album, Blood, I wonder like, oh shit, did I, did I really say that in that song? Should I have? Um, I I worry sometimes. There's a lot of violence in my last album, Blood, and but it's metaphorical violence. But it reads as, you know, you hear these. So there's some violent imagery that's supposed to be metaphorical and funny also. But I don't know if anyone, everyone is going to hear the humor or the metaphors in it. So I, I do have worries sometimes about what I've done, and I and I. And I know that if I were Taylor Swift, I would not um, have ever been able to put those songs out there into the world, or I would have been, you know, my career would have been over, probably. <laughs> or not, maybe not. People, Maybe people would love it if Taylor Swift wrote about <laughs> chopping someone's hands off or something. <laughs> metaphorically. I would like that, yeah. I would um, love it. <laughs> um, yeah, and one thing I'd actually like to ask just uh, briefly is, um, I remember um, years ago, um, you, uh, you, sorry, just one sec. I'm oh, sorry, that's my chair, sorry. My chair's wiggling, making noises. Oops. What? Sorry, are you bothering my chair? I won't. Um, sorry about that. I just, I just, um, yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, one thing I just wanted to ask about briefly was that, um, um, yeah, I remember like, uh, I think it was 1995, you were to do a European tour, which at the time um, got canceled due to um, uh, issues with depression. And it was, I think it was written off as like exhaustion. But I was wondering, do you think like nowadays um, we're more accepting of that? I think in the sense that we're, we're it seems like a, a globally, we're a lot more accepting of, or not accepting, but understanding of mental health. We're understanding of anxiety issues and we're understanding of uh, depression. And um, I was just wondering, what's your take on that? Do you think um, the situation has gotten better about discussions about these issues now where it does seem like I have seen artists who have canceled shows and they've just expressed that was their reason why? Oh yes, I think there's so much more, so much more awareness and um, compassion and understanding today mm -hmm. for people's mental health issues than there were back then. I mean, I when I when I canceled the tour because I was having this really bad, um, really debilitating bout of depression, and my publicist said it was called it quote unquote nervous exhaustion which was what that was what publicists said in those days it was it covered a wide range of um problems that an artist was having what it didn't mean anything you know nervous exhaustion to me to me that just doesn't really mean anything and i didn't ask her to say that but that was just sort of what people said back then yeah. and i i wanted to talk about it you know i wanted people to know um you know i'm clinically depressed it's very serious um this is why i'm making this like i understood it was like a major move to cancel a tour that had been put together but yeah people didn't really know or understand why i canceled and i and people didn't really seem to want to talk about it and people were mad at me P you know people on my crew there was a guy who was like i mean i totally understood that you know, he was going to be paid a certain amount of money. And um, I felt bad about that. And, and, but I, I just felt like I had no choice. I, ha I was in a, I had to go get some help. And to, but it was, sec you know, it was kind of secret. But today, uh, gosh, you know what, I'm taking such a long time to answer this question. No, no, absolutely. But my answer is like, yes, today, um, I think, anyone would be um you know anyone could say they're canceling because they need to get help because of a mental health situation um and it wouldn't be such a a weird thing to hear because it's so much there's so much more awareness now basically that's my answer yeah and in a way i think that's one aspect of of being an artist that has improved and and people don't 
think about, I mean, in the sense, like people think about, you know, the, like, as we were discussing earlier, the, the, the independence of, of their music and, and the, the freedom to kind of uh, publish your own music and to produce your own music. Yeah. At the same time, I think maybe these are little aspects that got overlooked too in, in, in um, how we've kind of improved. And I think, you know, other aspects too, like um, sort of marginalized uh, voices getting um, a chance to have their art um seen and heard as well and um, there are these like i think social um um i guess social improvements that um also make being an artist today probably better than it has been before yeah i don't know i don't know if it's better or not but mm -hmm. and also i think that i mean it's very it's very complicated today just because um there is so much that's out in the open and people it, that makes people more vulnerable in a way, I think, because um, if you choose to go public um, with something that you're dealing with, there are going to be a lot of people commenting yeah. on the situation and that can be a whole other can of worms that maybe you don't want to even open. Um, mm. Not everyone's comfortable being um putting putting their not everyone is comfortable putting their uh honesty out there into the world because it can be very dangerous and um I, I understand that not everyone wants to share like there this is a sharing um world that we live in people it's all about sharing everything and in my personal life i'm not really a sharer i don't I don't really like everyone to know what I'm dealing with in my, and I don't share very much. So um, I think people, sh people should have the right to be private if they want to be and, you know, don't badger people yeah. for information that they don't want to give. Um, but also I don't think people should lie. People okay. can be, people should be allowed to, be quiet and private, I think, but don't, but don't lie if you're going to start talking. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, in the sense that like, it, it feels like, yeah, as you were mentioned that like, if it, it is, we do seem to live in, in a kind of world where, I don't know, speculation and, and uh, I don't know, like, again, I think it is kind of maybe one of the negative aspects of like our modern social media too, is that you have that, um, kind of network now of, of speculation and invasion and yeah. yeah do you think there's any way to circumvent that or no i don't know it's like the only way is just to quit social media yeah. or to just clam up and stop talking you know go away it, it's like if anything i mean the bad thing about mo modern life is that is that pile on that happens you know like it's like like you said, there's speculation. People speculate, speculate until they decide they know what the facts are, and then that those those speculative fact, quote unquote facts are it gets that's what gets broadcast, you know, all mm -hmm. over the place, and it may not even be um, the truth of what's actually happening. Gosh, I'm not saying this very well. Yeah, the pile on the canceling. The canceling is becoming a little bit out of control. Canceling people for um on the basis of well we'll cancel someone even before all the facts are in, maybe mm -hmm. can be dangerous. Um and but on the other hand, oh shit, sorry, I lost my turn thought. I had another idea that I can't remember um there is another side there's a flip side which is good which is that um oh yeah so but if some if something bad if you do if you are a victim of a pylon or a cancellation worthy or justified cancellation or not um you can if you disappear and you stop talking and you go away people will eventually move on to the next victim so there is an out, you know, you can, the way to escape attention if you don't want it is just stop feeding the beast. 
you just don't supply the content. And yeah. that's good to know. It's like an escape route if you want one. It's escape into obscurity by stopping social media, stopping talking to people. Um, because it is, it's like a it's like a voracious monster that feeds on um like you said, like on speculation and drama. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's interesting you mentioned Taylor Swift because I think she's like the a, a kind of a prime target of that at the moment and yeah i think like i think i agree with everything you're saying it's uh you know in, in some ways you do have i guess some some sense of, of of being able to counter it but yeah i mean unfortunately i think like kind of conjecture and and uh speculation kind of rules at the moment i mean there are some um it's nice to see a, a villain exposed and taken down that's always nice but mm -hmm. you have to it's got to be it can it can be um yeah there's when there's a gray area it just gets a little bit um con uh, uh, dangerous sure um well uh, i've asked everything and i really appreciate all your time that you've given me um i was just wondering if there's anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up or no, I think you covered it all. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Um, just yeah, uh, people the new albums out uh, November seventeenth, isn't that correct? Uh, that sounds about right. Yeah. November anyway. <laughs> yeah, I know it's November. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm perfect, and people check it out. It's uh, Juliana Hatfield sings ELO. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, thanks Juliana. I really appreciate it, Tom. Okay, thanks for talking. Bye. Bye. Take care. Thank you for listening to that episode of postbornout.com interviews. We hope you enjoyed and stay tuned for more.